So what is it that stops managers from embracing coaching? Right? What's the thing that worries them the most about it? And one of the biggest things is the sense that you're going to open up something emotionally that you just don't know how to deal with. You can't close it down. You know, an employee's going to be upset in front of you. And, and I guess I tell people that, you know, look, just be a human being in those moments, right? right. You, you can acknowledge the emotion. You can be with the emotion. You don't have to solve the problem. And that's the other related thing that I see stop people from coaching, right? Which is they reflexively want to get into advice giving mode. There's a problem. I want to solve a problem. They don't want to help people solve their problem or understand their problem better. And I think if you can get over those two barriers, and I think that good training will help you do that. And if it's supported by a culture that supports coaching and development, it can be hugely impactful. All right, welcome back to the Better Human Show. We have got a wicked guest coming straight from Zurich today. Michael Watkins, what is going on, my man? Well, it's a great day to be alive, uh, Greg. You know, Isn't I, uh, every day a great day to be alive? But, you know, you say that, but but it, it's it's true, right? So my, my mantra is every day is a new adventure, right? And some adventures are good and some adventures are challenging, but it's never a dull moment these days. But no, things are good. Cool. Awesome. Well, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get a couple nuggets and some of your uh, your secret sauces to make sure that everyone else has some great days, even though it might be an adventure. So, for the audience, Michael is a globally recognized leadership transition expert and author of a best selling book called "The First Ninety Days." In fact, some of you might have already picked up this book. Proven Strategies for Getting Up to Speed Faster and Smarter. And one of the things we know about leadership is it is a very difficult, difficult role to fulfill because we are looking after human beings and we are also looking after the organization. And as you know, Michael, we tend to go through you know a lot of tra- uh, a lot of change and people don't deal with change. We were just actually chatting a little bit about this before we started recording. So why don't we start with the big question or why don't we start with the sort of base level of let's start with leadership. So in your definition of leadership, what are leaders responsible? What are leaders? Uh, what is a leader in today's world? And that's a big question, but how, how do you define that? Well, it, it, it is a big question, Greg. And I think it's it's got an answer and then a bunch of caveats and, you know, stuff that you need to kind of think about, right? You know, so, so I think, I teach leadership programs at IMD, right? And I, you know, I uh, almost always have people in the program say, tell me right away, you know, what is an effective leader, right? Mm-hmm. And so I tried out something, which I'll, I'm not going to go through the whole thing with you, but, but um, you know, it's around things like visioning and strategic thinking at more senior levels. It's deciding and driving execution. It's building teams, right? And creating the, the culture of the teams. It's stuff I know you know real well, you know, inspiring and motivating, listening and connecting, fostering trust, communicating effectively, you know, and that's kind of the core of what leaders do. But, but I'm also careful always to say that, you know, the the relative weightings of those things vary between different, you know, uh, organizations, different cultures, right? So, uh, you know, I, I, having given, you know, the students the answer, I immediately introduce a whole bunch of but however's right however it depends a lot on the situation you're in right so you know and, and i know situational leadership is something you 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 know lots about right but in the first 90 days i talk a little bit about uh situational change leadership you mentioned change right and i have this little model called the stars model right startup turnaround accelerated growth realignment sustaining success mm-hmm. and I use that model basically to help people think a little bit about what's the what's the transition challenge and what's the organization that I'm kind of taking over and what state is it in and how might that change the way I need to show up as a leader in the organization right yeah. so l- l- let's let's jump into change um yeah, as we're good. saying cha- people don't deal with change well and you know the interesting thing uh, about change is we're always changing I don't think we ever live a sort of static sort of life right there's always something adjusting what are the reasons people have such a difficult time with change? What do you think about that? So, so it's mostly about fear of loss, I think, right? So I think that among the most important, you know, not, the things that most motivate us, I think, in general, and unfortunately, we see politicians sometimes playing on this, are, are, you know, are fear, right? Fear and loss. And I think that we know from all the good stuff that's been done by, you know, social psychologists that people are more sensitive to losses than gains, right? right. You know, I, I, I take something away from you. It hurts more than if I 
the opposite of giving it to you, right? And so, it, you know, there's a term for it, lost aversion. And so, people are very tuned into, am I going to lose something here? And that pretty quickly gets coupled to a fear, right? And, and I think there's different, different levels of fear. There's a fear, hey, will I have a job, right? And right. be able to put, you know, food on the table for my family. There's a fear, will I still be, feel competent in this new world? Will I still have status in this new world, right? So, you can pretty quickly get at some really deep stuff that motivates people yeah. pretty much across all cultures, yeah? And I think to that that fear and loss kind of, you know, equation, I think, is what really is at the, at the core of it. And, and, and telling people it's going to be okay doesn't help. Correct. Right. Correct. Uh, the it Jedi mind. Mind. Don't worry. There are no droids here. Yeah. <laughs> <Be fine. laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, I use hey, that no line all the time. When I I start, right. I use that line all the time when I'm doing training. I'm like, the one thing we're not going to teach you is how to do the Jedi mind trick, right? And what is that? Like, everything's fine. Don't worry about it, right? And we were joking about uh, this earlier, you know, the the change manager or the person that's affected by change. The the only difference between them is they've had the information longer, right? And they've had more time to sit with it and process it. But you said something earlier, which is, you know, uh, I'm just going to paraphrase into our identity. People people have a fear of losing their uh, position, their title, their their. But at, at, at a core, it's their identity. Um, how important is it for us as leaders to to recognize that, you know, as much as we talk about your leadership brand and your leadership identity, it's really not about that. It's it's about others. And maybe this isn't a question, maybe it's just a more of a more of a statement and you could share some thoughts to this, which is, you know, leadership is a selfless act and and it's not about you sometimes. It's really about others. We might argue leadership is the ultimate parental role. It's, it's, you know, mm, not your children, but it is the same dynamic of relationship, right? So, you know, let me flip this into a question. What do you think leaders need to operate with in today's world to successfully lead teams, lead people? And, and I'll add this in, lead the success of the organization. Well, first, I think it's a lovely way of framing it, right? I, I, I wish more leaders saw their responsibilities as, as kind of stewardship and, and, you know, caring for groups of people, you know, um, cause I think that's the right orientation because you're in a position of power and you, you, you have this group of people, you know, in your, in your hands to, to a degree. Right. I, I do think that to, to me, a lot, the word that came up as you were talking was trust, right? The word that came up was trust, right? And to what extent do the people you're leading trust you, that you have your, their best interests at heart, right. that you're going to help them in one way or another move through these times of transition, which are really challenging. And that can be, you know, going to the next place in the organization that we're going. It could be, hey, you know, leaving the organization, but doing it fairly and with dignity. You know, I, I'm a huge believer in the power of fair process, Greg, right? That, you know, you may not be able to save everybody, right? But at a minimum, you can be fair on the way people are dealt with in the organization, even when hard things are happening, like you're doing some kind of, you know, restructuring or, or, or reduction. So that trust word, right? And how how leaders kind of create that sense of trust and, and sustain that sense of trust with their people. So much, I think, flows if, if your people trust you, yeah, in the end. Yeah. I often say to people, trust is an outcome, not 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 a thing that you create. It's 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 a it's a result of how you showed up. There's a guy by the name of Charles Green that created a trust formula. Have you ever heard of it? Or, or heard of Charles oh, Green? I'm familiar with, with a guy named David Meister who created something for, he wrote a book called The, the Trusted Advisor and it's it, yeah. he has something somewhere it's called The Trust Equation, you know? Yeah. So, but tell me, tell me about it. So the trust equation, it might be the, uh, the actual same, which uh, trust equals credibility plus reliability plus intimacy divided by self-orientation. And you could have the most skill and knowledge. That's the credibility. The reliability is you show up, you deliver, you execute, you're available for people. And the intimacy isn't the weird perverted intimacy. It's the it's the social intimacy. It's the insight to another person. It's the relation into who this person is. I know who you are. I know you're married. I know you live in Zurich. And there's a, there's an intimacy when we when we connect. And while we might be perfect across the board in those areas, it's the self orientation that dis disrupts the trust. Right? Right, where it all becomes about me. And, you know, I see this happening a lot with leaders where 
as much as their role is to serve others, they are operating out of their self-orientation. And that maybe has a little bit to do with the fear and loss that you were talking about, right? Absolutely, right? Because if I think that you're operating from a place of self-interest, mm -hmm. am I going to trust you with my future? I don't think so, right? Uh, or I'm going to be highly skeptical about what, what is going on. And especially when the kind of magnitude of changes we're seeing coming. I mean, I'm doing a lot of work related to AI these days, which I think everyone on the planet is too, like I'm a great company, right? But one of the most interesting things that's come out recently for me, and it's connected around AI, is this big study that Workday did uh, recently and published um, about the trust gap with AI, right? And how, you know, 60% of the organizations, neither the leaders nor the employees trusted the organization to implement AI in a way that was fair right and transparent yeah and think about what that means when we're talking about the magnitude of the changes that you know ai is likely to bring right and this has led to a conversation with one ceo I, i'm coaching and i'm actually going next week to do a, a session in the u.s with his executive team about how does his organization become you know a trusted organization around the implementation of ai and, and the advantages, the big advantages to the organization of doing that, right? And what would it take to be that, you know, for people? So, so yeah, so, no, yeah. So, what what is that? How do you how how do they achieve this? How do they create trust? What, how? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's yeah. a little bit of your your show for next week. So, what are you going to be speaking to them about, which is going to help resolve yeah. this, this challenge of trust? So, look, I think there's a lot of different elements to it, but to me, it starts with transparency. To a reasonable degree. I, I once worked with a senior leader who described part of his leadership style as transparency to the point of pain, mm. right? Now he was a doctor, so that was kind of weird, but anyway, that's another story. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think the point he was making was push that that boundary, you know, as, as far as you can about being transparent and also be transparent about what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And maybe be transparent about what you can't necessarily share at the moment, you know. But I think if if people feel like information is being withheld, and they, and that you know stuff they don't that is material and could be shared potentially, right. I think it's super hard in those circumstances to build anything that looks like a a trusting relationship. And then you mentioned something in the trust equation, which is another big piece, right? Which is reliability, right? When I make a promise to you, do I follow through on that promise, right? Uh, am I going to go to bat for the organization? Do you trust me to kind of represent us collectively well? Yeah. So, I mean, those are some of the, yeah. the elements, Greg, I would, I think I would focus on. Yeah. I think people have a very hard time being transparent. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's opening up the kimono sometimes, right. And, and you're, you're floating into people's insecurities. You know, I, I used to run my company open book management with the exercise of being mm -hmm. transparent. And I lost some employees along the way because when we had some difficult months or, you know, we had a rough year and they're seeing the numbers, their immediate fear is going into job safety, you know, security. And, and as much as, you know, people want transparency from leaders, right? What we also want is security and transparency can sometimes disrupt that, right? So 100%. it's uh, it's it's a fine line to walk. But the interesting thing about this, and I'm sure you'll agree with it, which is information pr provides emotional containment. So in the absence of information, right, this is where our skepticism kicks up and our radar goes up and the hair in the back of our neck stands up because... Without information, we're 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 surviving in the moment as per our perceptions. We're, right? we're hyper vigilant, right? We know from all the research on this, we go into a mode of hyper vigilance. We're waiting for something, you know, not so good to happen to us, right? The lion to jump out of the yeah, out, out of the, the forest, right? right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, no, that's I often, exactly right, Greg. I often tell a story, which is, you know, you and myself were were Neanderthals about three hundred thousand years, uh, three hundred thousand years ago. Right, tiger jumps out from the bush. Right, we go running. We go running up down the down the uh, down the the valley. We climb a tree and we're sitting up top of the tree and we're looking down and we're seeing the tiger. And we're like, oh, thank goodness, we are good tree climbers. And then as the tiger goes away, we still sit in the tree. And the question that we ask is, who's going to go first? I, go, <laughs> I love it. You go first, bud. <laughs> right. And even though we've been in the tree for three days and there is no tiger, yeah, the perception we're, is we're still waiting for someone to. Still waiting for someone yeah, to jump no. out. And, and I think this is the hole where, you know, um, leadership is you do go first. You know, Simon Sinek, I love his book, which is the title, which is Leaders Eat Last, right? Um, yeah. 
because it is about us going first and taking a little bit of a risk. And that comes back to the parental role, right? As parents, we would do that for our children. We would we would go and test and step up and we would implement in order to ensure that security and provide that information to our kids. It, it creates really interesting tensions though, right, for senior leaders. So I, I was just, I've been working on a, an article about the leaders that sit on, you know, C-suite teams and how they need to both sort of wear the hat of the enterprise but mm-hmm. also represent their own parts of the organization mm-hmm. and that inherent push pull that comes from that. Right. Because you're right. You, you, you know, you, Greg, you're, you're running the finance department. You're there as a representative of the finance department, your finance people are depending on you. You've got commitments to them. And then you're sitting in a meeting where you're being asked to kind of take a bit of a hit for the good of the enterprise. Right. Oh, how do you manage that kind of tension? Right. And, and I think it's sort of built into the leadership roles at the top. And I think it's kind of interesting, right? Because it goes exactly to that issue of how do you continue to maintain trust with your people, right? Even when sometimes you have to do things that are kind of going to kind of hurt, right? Your organization. Yeah. I had a client once say to me, and this was a couple of years ago, they're like, Greg, we need our leaders looking after the people, but we need them driving the business. Exactly. And I was like, that oh, tension, right? Correct. Correct. Almost that oxymoron, right? Because the, the yeah, human yeah. side is other than the organizational, the enterprise side. You were talking about uh, situational leadership before, and it sort of, you know, perked yeah. up my my thoughts, which is there is so much out there from a place of leadership concepts, right? Leadership training. In in your world, what what do you find effective? If you were to recommend leadership development and training and coaching to someone, what would be some key books and some key concepts that, as a leader, these are like mandatory that you should learn? So, so I think it goes back to that sort of little list I gave you of some of the qualities, right? I think that, you know, and I'm going to talk more about senior leaders because I, I'm, that's more where I work, right? More, right? That capacity to vision and create a vision, you know, that big, hairy, ambitious goal, the Jim Collins stuff, right? That, that ability to craft a vision, enroll people in a vision, yeah, I think is super, super important. Yeah. Um, Teams, team building, boy, there's just so much, right? And I, I I used to teach at the Harvard Business School, and Amy Edmondson, you may know that name, you probably know that name, Psychological Safety, right, was a colleague of mine. And, you know, the ability to both staff a team with the right people in the right roles, but then pull up that team together, right? And so some of the work on team building, I think, is super important. Her work, I think, is super important, her book. And she's actually got a new one out. I'm not, I'm not going to do a brief Amy Edmondson commercial here, right? On learning from failure, which I think is super, super interesting, you know, kind of work she's doing. But that capacity, your capacity as a leader to really create an environment in which, you know, truth can be told, mm-hmm. tough conversations can be had, right? I think it's just so critically, critically, you know, it's it's yeah. essential, really, right? If you're going to lead a team effectively, I mean, you know, back to the first ninety days, real briefly, right? So I mostly work with leaders taking new roles. Most of those leaders don't get to build teams; they inherit somebody else's team. Yeah, right. Congratulations, you've inherited Greg. You've inherited my team. You're taking my role. <laughs> that team's not your team. <laughs> that team's not your. That team's not your team, right? right? You don't know those people. You don't know how they were led. You don't know what their qualities are. You don't know if they're the team you're going to need, given your understanding of what you're there to do, right? So you're in this process, and it's a very awkward process, usually, for everybody, of trying to assess these people and decide, you know, what changes are you going to make, if any, in what order, and how are you going to evolve the team, and how are you going to keep producing as you evolve the team? You know, until you've got the right people in the right roles while simultaneously trying to, you know, begin to move the business in some way and it's super hard right to 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 manage those those basic tensions um so i guess that's a that's a start i think effective communication although i'm struggling to think about a great book i i know it's purely about communication yeah i'm I'm sure you know great books about communication because that's a core part of the business that you do um so so i'll turn the question around what what on communication what, what do you recommend as a Communication skills. Well, first you mentioned difficult conversations before, and I, you know, I, I often push back on people, and I say I think we need to, you know, redefine 
um, how we speak. You know, we got to be very aware of the words we use and the effect that they have. And, you know, if I'm always thinking about, I got to have a difficult conversation or this is going to be a difficult interaction. In a lot of cases, what we're setting ourselves up to do is to operate in more of a conflict sort of defensive, as you said, fear and loss type of state. And you're, you're, you're not going to be able to communicate well during that. Um, however, if we redefine that and we say, look, it's not a difficult conversation, we need to go and have a conversation and we need to think about what we're trying to achieve out of this conversation is, is, is really important. And there's a ton of stuff out there. You know, one of the main models that I teach is something called parent, adult, child. It's a transactional analysis. Uh -huh. So sure. Eric Burns. <laughs> yeah. So his yeah, book is course. called, yeah, his book is called games people play. And the whole, the whole premise of it is my personality interacts with your personality and depending on the transaction that we are on determines the type of uh, effectiveness that we have, right? And the majority yep. of interactions that we have or the way we communicate is what is known as parent to child. So I, Michael, mm -hmm. I speak to you like a child. I'm like, listen, I need you to ba 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 And when I start to now get this response and this behavior from you, I have to recognize that it wasn't you that created the transaction, it was me. And if I start to adjust how I communicate and if I approach it from the, from the place of questions, hey, Michael, can we talk about X? What are your thoughts about this? Can I share with you what I want to see you do? Um, we just might be able to, to, to yeah, move good. out of this sort of difficult conversation and move into an effective line of communication, right? I think that's awesome. You just reminded me, Greg, of a, a book that did come to my head as you were talking, which is a book called Nonviolent Communication. Yeah, I I've, you know this book seen it. I've never read it's, it. I've seen it. No, it's worth it's worth the read. It's super interesting, right? About and it and it gets to some of the linguistics that you're talking about. And then there was a God, I'm trying to remember the title of it. There was a coaching book put out recently, but it was coaching for managers, basically. Yeah. It kind of tries to take the, the coaching toolbox and sort of simplify it and apply it to the manager conversations. So I think I, I I'm with you. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So saying. let's talk about coaching. But before we go there, this is a question that I get a lot. And you mentioned it earlier, uh, which is how can I motivate people? I get that all the time from leaders, which is I got a team member. Uh, uh, do you have some things that I could do to motivate them? And I wanted to ask, what's your opinion on that? Can we motivate people? Is there this thing as the carrots and the stick? Or is it always really an intrinsic motivation that drives the, the result and the behavior change? Yes, <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> so, 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 here's the thing, right? Which is, you know, I, I think the way I sort of approach this conversation is, I want, I would like Greg to put out discretionary effort, right? I, I want Greg to do more than, you know, just his job title, his compensation, the hygiene factors you know, his goals would would incentivize him to do, right? So, I kind of take that as a baseline. Right, that you're, you know, you're. A, let's assume you're a good employee, and and that you know you you want to do a reasonably good job, but you've also got other priorities in your life, and you've got goals, and you got a role, and all that kind of stuff. So it's really then about how do I how do I, you know, motivate, inspire that person to put out even more energy on behalf of the organization within limits. I mean, we, we gotta we're not out to suck people dry here, right? And that gets to two things i think one is and it's also influenced by generations by the way because i think younger generations are more focused on purpose and caring about purpose right and so it goes to are you connecting them to a purpose or a vision or both that they actually care about right. and, and and meaning right we talked about identity meaning a set people i think intrinsically want a sense of meaning in what they do and i think certainly younger generations maybe more than mine or yours you know, they really want to feel like what they do matters in some way or another, you know? Right. And so connecting them to that sense of, you know, a purpose or vision, I think is a big piece. And then again, I think there's a, there's an element of this that's about individual differences in what fundamentally drives people, you know? There's an old framework, uh, psychologist from Boston University, David McClellan, years ago, but I think it's still super helpful. He sort of looked at what were some fundamental drivers for people beyond survival needs, right? You know, so we're up, up we're up Maslow's hierarchy of ways, right? And need for power and control, right? Need for achievement, 
need for affiliation, mm. right? Affiliation, you know, if you're high in need for affiliation and making you a part of something bigger than yourself, having you connected to a team in regular contact and interacting with people and, you know, is going to be valuable, right? Mm. Need for achievement, right? You achieving your goals, those goals being ambitious, right? Need for power and control, you know, giving you a sense of status, control, influence, right? So I, I think it breaks down a little bit along those lines, too. There's sort of an overarching piece, I think, that's around vision and purpose. And there's kind of like a finer grained piece about me knowing you well enough to know that being part of a team matters to you, right? Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, then folds into, you know, with the culture I'm trying to create in the organization. And maybe I want people who are high on affiliation. Maybe I don't want people who are necessarily high on power or or real high on power, unless mm -hmm. they're running the organization. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> does that make sense? It does. It, it does. does. It really does. You know, uh, I like the way you broke that down, which is, you know, we have this need for affiliation, which is what I talk a lot about the community, right? I think, in fact, I was chatting about this earlier with someone, which is what's the worst thing about being terminated? It's not that fact that you weren't performing or, or, or it just sucks now that I got to go get a new job. I've been kicked out of the village, right? Yeah. And, and that's- no, it's, it's, and it's a very primal thing, isn't it? Right. Correct. Correct. Because that's yeah. what we need. We need that affiliation, right? We're, we're a herd animal, right? We live in communities and stuff. Um, and it's, really important. Important. yeah, it's really important that we recognize that, um, we're dealing, we're not just dealing with people's feelings. We're dealing with people's psychology as leaders and, and trying to figure out who they are and what drives them and what those driving factors yeah. are. I like the way you broke that down, which is where do they sit in one of these three areas, right? You know, we get a lot to connect back to the, the point you made earlier about change and fear and loss, right? I mean, loss of those relationships is a real loss. You know, right. it's a deep loss. It's almost to your point, a primal loss. You know? And that, by the way, can also impact the survivors, right? right? The people who stay have also lost things. They've lost relationships, you know, potentially they're, they, that if they're high need for affiliation, that sense of team may have you know, evaporated to some degree. And so how do you, how do you start to rebuild that? And, and I think also, you know, the people that remain with the organization are looking at how you're treating the people who are leaving, right? It's back to fair process, right? And, and do they feel like people are being treated reasonably, fairly, reasonably well, because, you know, you've yeah. got to get them to move on too with you. Yeah. And it's super important to do that. Right. Yeah. You were talking about the younger generations really sort of having this need for purpose and stuff. And yeah, I agree with you. I think it's really important that an organization is able to create a purpose-driven strategy. And there was a guy by the name of Joey Ryman, and I've recommended this book a lot, mm. called The Story of Purpose. This was before Simon mm. Sinek. And mm. talked about large organizations that have been around for a hundred years, like a Procter & Gamble. And you know, why are they so successful? And one of the things that they've been able to do is really instill this purpose. And I got to take my hat off to, he's a CEO of a company called Griffith Foods. And um, mm -hmm. I used to do a lot of uh, work with them and do their sales conferences and I'd watch his presentation. And this is a global organization. They're $2.4 billion in annual revenue. Like this is not a small outfit here, but you go to any place in the world, any department, any person and you say what is your purpose and they'll say this is what my purpose is and you say what is the organizational purpose and they say well this is what our organizational purpose is and how does your purpose align with them and they'll go ding and they've been created this internal purpose-driven university mm -hmm. which every single employee goes mm -hmm. through this internal training to help them figure out what their purpose is and what's really interesting so cool, right? yeah super cool that if their if their purpose is misaligned with the organization they will help exit you in a very positive way right because very interesting i'll, I'll definitely check it out check it out and it's not yeah. about having I, uh, identical values but it's about having aligned values and an aligned purpose right no it reminds me of the story it's maybe a apocryphal story about you know the the senior government official visiting the NASA facility in the 60s and asking the janitor, you know, what do you do here? And the answer was, I help put men on the moon, right? You know, it's that that sense, right. of, sense, set of, a sense of alignment with the, the bigger mission and vision and purpose of the organization. Yeah, so 100%. Right. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to swing back to coaching because this is a big aspect sure. of, of um, 
leadership. And then I want to talk to you about sort of what, what are some best practices for people to do in the first 90 days, right? Um, so is there, I was going to say, is there an over expectation of leaders coaching me as the employee all the time? Like there's this, this expectation that now that you're my leader, you must coach me, you must serve me. Uh, and how can leaders sort of live to that responsibility? So it's a super good question. And I, I guess the, the only reason I'm hesitating is I see such variation between organizations and their cultures around this. I mean, there's organizations where part of part of leaders' responsibility is viewed as being development of people, right? Yeah. And if you're going to develop people, mentoring and coaching is one of the are, are two of the primary modes you use to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's been good research that shows that. That is even more important than any formal program you can be sent to, right? In the end, that mentoring and coaching matters a lot. <clears throat> you know, so, and also, of course, on the job experience looms super large. But I guess I just, you know, there's, and there's organizations, and I, you know, it happens too when people are taking new roles, Greg, right? Where there are, there are sink or swim organizations, right. right? It's leadership development through Darwinian evolution. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> You know, uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, you know, it's as we have suffered, so shall ye, you know, yeah. whatever your favorite metaphor for, you know, you're, you're on your own, buddy, you know, good luck and God bless. There's still lots of organizations that look like, that, you know, yeah. now I think I'm obviously I, I, I do coaching, right? I coach people taking the roles. I'm a believer in the power of coaching. Mm -hmm. You don't have, you know, and I, most of the organizations I work with these days, I've come to believe in the power of coaching, right? Mostly though, coaching by externals, by executive coaches or leadership coaches. I think some I see making progress with the manager's coach kind of idea, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're going to go down that road, you really have to, and you kind of alluded to it earlier when you were talking about communication, you really have to train people about how to do that. Do you know what the biggest worry is when you, so I talk about managers right. coaching my program, right? Because we, we have people going through very intensive small group and individual coaching. And I have one part of the program where I say, I, I want you to reflect on what these coaches do and what they do well. Yeah. And I want you to talk about what of that you can take back, you know, to your own organization, understanding that, you know, me coaching an employee is different than a, than an executive coach or a you know leadership right. coach coaching somebody, right? Yeah, one's one's volunteered and the other one is voluntold. Yeah, exactly, right. And and so there's you know there's lots of important uh, you know questions there, but I, but I asked them sort of what's the you know what would stop you, right? What 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 would worry you? And and the, the basic answer is I open up a box that I can't close, mm. right? Or a problem comes up and I feel like I need to own it or solve it. Yeah. And, and, and so you've got to help people. I think as if you're going to have your managers be coaches, you have to help them understand that they're there to facilitate to a degree. They're not there to take the problem on board. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if someone is getting emotional in the moment, it's going to be okay. Right. That's just a normal human transaction, right. In, in the terms that you describe. Mm -hmm. So you've got a really good training. You've got to have a culture that supports it, you know, and then I think you can have, tremendous impact on the organization. So what is it that stops managers from embracing coaching, right? What's the thing that worries them the most about it? And one of the biggest things is the sense that you're going to open up something emotionally that you just don't know how to deal with. You can't, you can't close it down. You know, an employee is going to be upset in front of you. What do we do? You know, and, and I guess I tell people that, like, you know, look, just be a human being in those moments, right? Right. You, you can acknowledge the emotion, you can be with the emotion, you don't have to solve the problem. And that's the other related thing that I see stop people from coaching, right, which is, they reflexively want to get into advice giving mode, right? There's a problem, I want to solve the problem, they don't want to help people solve their problem, or understand right. their problem better. Right. And I think if you can get over those two barriers, and I think that good training will help you do that. And it's been supported by a culture of you know, that supports coaching and development, it can be hugely impactful. I say to people all the time, sometimes when you're giving advice, it's not for them, it's for you. Because your ego is filled, your narcissism is 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 elevated because it go it feels good to give someone advice, right? And if right. you're not careful, you you 
you switch out of, as you described, this is a moment not for me to give advice. This is a moment for me to just listen. Because the more people emotionally vomit and get it out, right, the more they clear the path. And in a lot of cases, they'll figure out the problem themselves. It's a it's a debrief exactly. that we teach, right? So I totally agree with that. Um, 100%. So let's jump into the first 90 days because I get this question a lot from yeah. clients as well. You know, they've, they, I think of one client, she was in an organization for, you know, 15, 16 years and transitioned to another organization. And she called me up and she says, any advice for the first 30 days? So I'm going to change that to, to you, Michael. So what advice yeah. do you give for leaders transitioning in the first 90 days? How could they make that really effective? Sure. Well, so there's, I mean, there's, it's a really good subject, obviously, and I wrote a whole book on it, right? But the starting point for me is understanding what kinds of transitions you're going through, because it's usually multiple, right? You know, you're joining a new organization, but you're also going into a new function, you know, you're you're being promoted, but it's a newly created role, you know. Um, oh, by the way, you're moving your family across the country or internationally, right? And so just understanding that there's likely to be layers of transition going on and really unpacking that. So you, and, and understanding which of those is hard, right? Is the real the real hard stuff here, the fact that you're moving your you, you know, your your family to Uzbekistan. Right, and you're going to be happily in in the uh, you know office of the global corporation, you know, uh, and your family's living in Uzbekistan. It can suck with no disrespect to Uzbekistan, right? But you get my point. Um, right. And that may be the core of the real challenge here, as opposed to the fact that you're moving, you know, to a different division of the company, right? Something along those lines. So that would be the starting point. I think focusing really intensely early on on learning and connecting. Right. To me, those are the absolute foundations of every successful transition is, Greg, I want you to get up the learning curve about the organization, about the culture, about politics as rapidly as possible, because that then buys you time to start to have an impact. Right. right. The connection is I want you to understand who your key stakeholders are. And I want you to be focused on understanding what are the most important alliances you need to build, not just relationships, but alliances that are going to be important to get things done. Mm. I want you to be methodical in starting to assess your, the team you've inherited. We talked a little bit about this, right? Mm. I call this the repairing the airplane and mid-flight problem, right? Which is, you know, you've inherited this team. You're, you typically have goals that you need to achieve, but the team isn't quite what you need it to be. How do you involve that team into into what you need it to be. And then I, I love it when I get to talk to people before they're actually in the new role, because then we can have a conversation about how do you want to show up in this role, right? right. What's your leadership brand? What are people going to, what, what are people expecting? Do you want to play into those expectations? Do you want to, you know, try to counter those expectations? What are the key messages you want to send early on about your leadership and yourself, right? Um, who are you going to try to communicate with? So if you can get people early, right. right, it's incredibly powerful because you can help guide them through the process of you should do some meetings before you're formally in the role, right? right? Because, and this is a bizarre thing, but it's true. People will tell you things before you're formally in the role that they won't tell you after they're formally in, you're formally in the role, even mm -hmm. though it's just, it's the same you, right? It's a bizarre thing, but there's something about that early kind of weird, you know, uh, messy process before you're actually formally in the job that is hugely advantageous if you can take advantage of it. Is this making sense? Is this yeah, so, you know, I often, uh, I'll just paraphrase that, like get together with people, go out for lunch, have a beer, get to know them, have that sort of human intrapersonal sort of conversation. So my first interaction with them isn't leader or team member. My first interaction is Greg and Michael went out, we had to good bite to eat. We hung out, we laughed, we shared some stories, we created the intimacy, yeah. right? And yeah. thereafter, there's a there's a baseline for people to, to connect with. Again, this is where emo uh, information provides emotional containment. And the information in this is my experience with you at lunch, right? So in the absence yeah. of information, I will end up filling in those gaps and building up the mental models and movies and stories in my head of who you are, specifically because other people tend to say things, right? Oh, here comes Michael, by the way, I heard yeah, this about yeah. that blah, 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 right? So what we often say to facilitators, because we do multi-facilitators through some of our programs, and yep. what we used to do was this big debrief between facilitators. Be like, okay, there's this mm. guy, Michael, in the room. Just be aware of him. He's a little, he's a little challenging. 
And the danger <laughs> is, is the facilitator would walk in and they go, ah, there he is. Okay. And then Michael sticks up his hand and the perception goes, Bad ah. mind Michael. <laughs> correct. Correct. So we got to a stage of debriefing with each other without telling each other who these people are. It was more about here's where we've left off in the room. Here's what we've covered. Here's the group size. Here's what you need to focus on. And then let people come up with their own conclusions in real time. Super nice. It makes complete sense, right? Because you're creating a set of expectations and they can do self-fulfilling prophecies, right? Pretty quickly if you're not super careful with it. Correct. No, I get, I get it uh, 100%. Um, yeah, I guess the, the other, you know, the thing about transitions too is I love coaching people through transitions, right? Especially senior people. And my personal favorite is first-time CEOs because it's just such a huge leap. No matter how prepared you are, you always, you know, CEO after the fact will always tell you. Mm. I thought I was prepared, but no, right? The job was way bigger than I thought it was, and I can help them, right? But I help them by both being an advisor and a coach. And I need to know and be very thoughtful about when I operate in one mode or the other. I see you, you're, you're, you're pedaling towards a cliff, you know, you know, I'm not going to start a conversation of the, how do you feel about that cliff, Greg? You know? <laughs> do you think it's a good cliff? Do you think it's a bad cliff? You know, um, uh, if you go off that cliff, what do you, you know, Greg, there's a cliff, right? You're heading, you're heading for a cliff. Stop right? Stop pedaling and let's talk about how you're going to deal with this, right? So I, I find it's, it's you know, one of the things I've had to learn because I didn't come out of a coaching background. I came out of a much more advisory background right. was how to balance those things, right? And, and when to do that. And I think for leaders, it's very similar, right? You're, you know, you're working with someone who reports to you, when are you going to be in an advisory mode and when are you going to coach them? And it's a, it's a real delicate balance, I find. I love, I love what you just described. I think you nailed that nugget, which is we have responsibilities in all uh, in executing these, these skills, but there is a difference between coaching and advising and advising sometimes is telling, like, I see what you're doing. You got to stop right now because it's a cliff. You don't see it. Uh, and I say this all the time. The biggest exactly. thing with coaches today is they're taught how to ask the feeling question. So how does that make you feel? And what would it feel like if you fell off the cliff? And how long do you think <laughs> you could soar through the air? And have you been skydiving before? And, you know, yeah, exactly. it's, it's like, as you said, stop it's, it's, because you're going down. It's not the fall that kills you. It's the sudden stop at the end, right? Yeah, correct, I get correct. it. But that, you know, you just, yeah. you answered something for me personally, which is, uh, you know, I always battle as uh, in my role as a coach, which is, is this a coaching session to to coach and facilitate and 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 you know think things through, or is this a coaching session which is I need to be more direct and telling? And a lot of my clients will call me up and be like, "We want to bring you in to coach this executive." I'll be like, "So what? What's what? What are you looking for?" And it will always come out. They need a little bit of Greg telling them what the hell not to do and what to do because no one's been direct enough with them. Michael, I can't believe how time flies. Um, I want to ask you the the our famous question, which is, what do you think we all need to do yep. to be better humans? But before we do that, I'm going to change that to, what do you think we could all do to be better leaders as, uh, as of tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And before we get into that, if the audience wanted to learn more about you, if they wanted to get in touch with you, if they wanted to, you know, um, uh, learn more about some of the, the, the uh, more about your company and the training, how can they get in touch sure. with you? So LinkedIn is the single best place to get me. And I, I, do my own LinkedIn, you know, I answer messages and stuff. So I just recommend people go to the LinkedIn profile and check me out there. You know, um, I'll definitely respond to you if you do, if you do that, the consulting company Genesis is www.genesisadvisors.com advisors with an ERS. It's, it's the organization that does all the first 90 day stuff, coaching programs, you know, similar, you know, uh, leadership development companies, similar to what you, you run, Greg, right? Um, yeah, that would be the, the, the big things. To, to, now, how do we be better leaders? Um, yeah, let me so tell you this. I, I, so, yeah. so it's really important, Michael, that you know we, we get this question answered. And, and coming from your experience, and I don't think there's a better person to answer this, what do you think we could all do to be better leaders as of tomorrow? So I'm going to put in a real quick plug here, which is I just published a new book called The Six Disciplines of Strategic Thinking, right? And I gave a presentation about that, that sort of, a, you know, book and the related stuff. And I said, we are facing 
the highest levels of turbulence economically, politically, socially, technologically of any time, I think, in my lifetime, right? And that leaders have to be prepared to deal with that. And I said, look, there's three things you need to do, right, to do that. You need to think strategically. I would say that. It's the new book, right? You need to build organizations that have adaptive cultures. Mm. And you need to, because adaptation is going to be constant in your organization. And you need to learn, you know, to be resilient in the face of everything that's going on. And if I were going to counsel leaders to focus on three things, that would be the thing. Get a better at strategic thinking, focus on making your organization as adaptive as possible, work on your personal resilience would be the capsule. It's amazing. Awesome advice. I think we're going to have to do a part two to this. And there's there's so much more, right? And uh, we'll, we'll schedule ourselves some more time for this. But for the audience, definitely go and connect with Michael on LinkedIn. Uh, I just added you, Michael. Uh, and I think I was looking for you on Instagram. I don't think I found you on Instagram. No. No, just LinkedIn. Uh, this is where yeah, professionals yeah, I'm a, live. <laughs> I, I, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. You know, I, I, I'm, not on, I'm not on Instagram and I'm certainly not on TikTok. Great. Yeah, so, sorry. yeah, yeah. I'm on TikTok just to scroll through the 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 garbage and sort of get my entertainment for about you know 15 minutes a day. Uh, but for the okay. audience, we're going to post all of Michael's links, his uh, links to his organization, the links to his book, his social handles. So if you didn't find him on on LinkedIn, but it's pretty easy, Michael Watkins. There's a few of them, but you'll see a handsome guy that's uh, you know ah. a little different than than what you look like now. It's funny how all our bio pictures look. Alike. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, right? I, I had someone tell me a couple of days ago it's time to update your your photo, Michael. You know, so. Yeah. Hey, it's a good photo. So if it's a good photo, I mean, you might want to leave it. But uh, to the audience, as usual, I hope tonight today was uh, informative and you picked up some nuggets. Michael's book is something you should definitely pick up. We are specifically this book, which is the first 90 days proven strategies for getting up to speed faster and smarter. And then your latest book, which is the six disciplines to strategic thinking. It is out now, correct? It is indeed. Yep. Amazing. So go pick those up. Michael, I'm going to afterwards ask you for a signed copy. So uh, I'll, I'll beg and plead you. can you. do that. Uh, but for the audience, if you like today's episode, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to share, go and follow Michael and uh, stay happy, stay healthy, and we will see you all next time. <laughs>